I want to pay tribute. And I have paid tribute. And I will continue to pay tribute to a woman named Jean Sachs, S-A-C-K-S. And she was named, at this time, it was a legend in journals publishing. And she was the head of the journals division at the University of Chicago Press. And I want to pay tribute, too, to the University of Chicago Press, because there was feminist studies, and there were other women's studies journals. But I had the good fortune of having an established press behind me, and I will never be able sufficiently to express my gratitude for that. So Jean was manager of the journals division. She was a re-entry woman. And Jean said, we've got to do something for women now. She came to Barnard for something that I had been, had a little hand in inventing called the Scholar and the Feminist Conference. So Jean came into the lunchroom of Scholar and the Feminist and said, start to talk to me. And we, you know, we had a terrific time. We had a terrific conversation. I was filled with vinegar and and hopefulness. And she said, you want to try starting this? And there was no question. I had just been offered the most glorious possible future. It was a tremendous gift from the goddess. And then, I won't say it was like a dream, because that's just gobbledygook. But it was almost like a dream. The table of contents came to me. And articles, review essays, archives, reviews, no poetry. We were to be as serious as serious could be. The name gave us a hard time. We thought of, believe it or not, Pharos, P-H-A-R-O-S, Lighthouse, and to one of us said, that's a tad phallic. Well, it was signs, because there was, of course, the idea of what is a sign. And I love the idea of a sign is pointing to the future, a roadmap. And there was also, of course, for the semiologists among us, there was what could a sign mean. But I love yeah. the idea of pointing. And... So all this went to the University of Chicago Press, this package, and, and they approved it. And we had a budget. There was so much to be done. And we were there when there were just enough women in the academy then. There were just enough. I had barely gotten tenure. So there were just enough women who had tenure. And, of course, there was opposition. Of course, there was opposition. What is this? But we were going to be utterly serious, and no one could refute the impeccability of the work that was being done. We are connected to the women's movement, but the university has its own place as well. And what a gift it was. One of the uh, regular things that we did, we, we followed, of course, the standard procedure of asking the leading figures in the field to re review the articles that we received. Uh, but then we always asked at least one person on the Duke faculty who was completely clueless about feminist scholarship to review the article as well. And they were, of course, sometimes they were honored but then sometimes they didn't know what the journal was, so they were clueless. But at any rate, we did an enormous amount of influencing other faculty at Duke and UNC to become aware of the field. And I think that had a long-term effect uh, because they were always being asked to do something. And of course, they couldn't admit that they didn't know what they were doing. So they had to, uh, they had to kind of get on board. The greatest pride was again that I, science was a shaping force in healing a rift that existed in the 70s between heterosexuals, fem feminists, 
and lesbian feminists because it was still considered daring and as they were considered daring that signs had a special issue um again with Estelle and Susan Johnson and myself as editors of something called the lesbian issue and there was with deliberate pun on the word issue um so that it was still so, but but that's what in that way I think that the signs at the time it was at Stanford really did shape uh the women's studies and feminist thinking and feminist action yeah. we also um started um a series of comparative perspective symposia one of our goals during the Rutgers years was to change the content of the journal from purely Anglo-American to covering the world in its complexity and fullness. So we devised these comparative perspective symposia, which always involved scholars from different regions of the world, activists from different regions of the world. Some of them were small, four to five contributors. Some of them were large, nine or 10 contributors. We, we desperately wanted to change the content in part because of the completely valid critique of hegemonic feminism as you know, overly Western, overly white, you know, generalizing from a tiny proportion of the world population. Um, we did some numbers. So 52% of our authors were from outside the US and 66% of the content focused on sites that were outside of the US. So we were really able, and that was not for just one year, that was for multiple years. We were able to you know, push the boundaries of scholarship so it was it was mind expanding it was field forming it, it was a good intervention i think and then also the kate stimson prize was a way of getting the university of chicago press to recognize the importance of feminist scholarship by putting you know a thousand dollars behind an article in this journal so that was an enormously important intervention too i think I am proudest of FPIP. I mean, I think that innovation, it reverberates in so many different ways, the, the Feminist Public Intellectuals Project. It both, you know, it both puts signs out there in the world in a different way and feminist scholarship out there in the world in a different way. But it also, I think, brings um, a different kind of readership to the actual journal. So I think it has this sort of circular kind of effect, I hope it does, you know, where we are able to speak feminism in a in a colloquial voice um, and in a public and engage in public debates in certain ways. Um, at the same time, that that publicness and that accessibility helps to um, uh, you know break down some of the barriers between academia and activism and journalism and public life that are so endemic to. The world and that that is that has troubled feminism forever. You know the relationship between academia, academia and activism. I do think the millennial issue is, in many ways, the most significant. It, of course, it's a different focus in that there were a lot of shorter essays, but on many different topics. So in terms of sort of looking at the whole terrain of feminist scholarship, I think that issue did that more than any other. You know, it was, it was a unique opportunity, obviously, and one that I think, I was pleased with how it came together. First one, we inherited, that is to say, we hadn't solicited, it was in the pile of things that came to us from Stanford, and it was um, Suzanne Kessler. She had interviewed uh, uh, OBGYNs mm -hmm. who, delivered children with no external genitalia so that we couldn't tell whether they were male or female and how the assignment was made completely culturally by the doctors with no reference to science. I, I think about that in terms of all that we know now and the centrality of the trans conversation in all of the work now as just amazing. And that's only 40 years ago. 
The other one that I think of a lot is Patricia Williams's uh, article on being the object of property. I think it was one of the first pieces that we published where the idea that you could have this compelling com combination of academic theory and complete personal testimony yeah. was very innovative. It doesn't seem innovative now, but the idea that you would use your personal experience to explain theory and vice versa was quite revelatory. I think that one of the lessons that we learned and that our readers came to appreciate through the submissions that we had is that there was no such thing as a women's issue anymore. Feminists were concerned with all issues. So when we thought about the kinds of topics that were important, we took up lots of issues that were not being talked about every day, but were so worthy of attention that it, it I mean, I could never identify one article, but I do think that we moved in really important directions. Uh, we did special issues on um, reproductive and genetic technologies, which I think was well ahead of its time. Um, we, we came into the editorship in the midst of the war on terror, and we did two special issues. I mean, I think a lot of them have come in some of the special issues. So I think of, um, you know, sort of the, the special issue we did on gender and the rise of the global right with my great co-editors on that. And I think, number one, you know, we were ahead of the curve on all of the stuff about gender, you know, ge gender ideology and how it's become a tool of the right and populism and all that. So we got that out there. I think there were almost every piece in that. You know, really, it was, they were rigorous, they were innovative, they had different angles on things, they made big arguments. But well, we thought at the time, I don't, I don't think so now, really, but what we thought was the, the issue in which we had to have transit, a group of essays on French feminist theory complicated feminist theory, each yeah. of those essays had to be translated. And then there were these factions in France, you know, there were factions among the feminists there. And we had Hélène Sixou of one faction uh, on the board, but then the other faction, oh, I forget, that the, the was extremely angry about that, and we had to meet with them, and so on. The article that caught everybody's attention and it just came over the transom, though we knew the author. And this, of course, was Carol Smith Rosenberg, The Female World of Love and Ritual. And there were some charts in it that her daughter, Leah, who was then, you know, 10 or 11, something like that. Leah had drawn them. They were in pencil. We had to sort of slightly, you know, put them in a shape. And so we look and said, all right, this is our lead article. Again, impeccably done. And the combination of impeccability and imagination. So thank you, Ca Carol, Carol, thank you. We were very busy just finding things, not so much finding the forgotten figures routine that we're, we've just sort of completed or are in right now, but we were finding concepts and ways of approaching material. Uh, we were mu much more trying to fill in the gaps. We knew there was such a thing as women, and we knew their experiences of the world were, were different than those of men, and we knew that the difference in those experiences were the result of a culture more than nature. And so we were we were trying to show that all of the other disciplines made choices in terms of what they studied that had impact on women, that women were central to all other disciplines, even though those disciplines ignored them. We were very strongly committed to making sure that signs 
remained the premier journal in the field. And when Kate Stimson started Signs, there were two other feminist journals. By the time it came to Rutgers, there were almost 100 feminist journals. So the intellectual terrain was changing dramatically. Many of those journals were discipline based, whereas we were interdisciplinary. But we were trying to do a kind of field formation to help support completely new notions of feminist knowledge production. What we were doing in signs was not just a, a shift of metaphors, but feminist knowledge production that was completely attuned to the politics of knowledge. And certainly one of the, the big issues, that, that's much too sophomoric a way to put it, but that some of the really important struggles when we were editing signs and even before as we were thinking about bringing the journal was that I think at that point, women's studies departments in particular had not at all been successful in bringing feminists of color into the journal, yeah. into the academy, and to so forth. And I think that has changed dramatically, that that has been an incredibly important direction of growth. But yeah. that doesn't mean that, you know, the world as a whole uh, recognizes that, that importance. I think that in recently, too many of the burning questions I see is from feminist scholars are how feminism has failed, how warped it is, how partial it is, how blindsided it is, how go down the list. And, you know, less on like, how the hell are we still here? <laughs> you right. know, I mean, I, you know, my burning questions are like, you know, why patriarchy still? I mean, that's, you know, why male dominance still? Why male violence still? Those are, you know, how do we understand, you know, male investment in, in brutalizing women? How do, I mean, these to me are, you know, they're, they're, you know, I often think in feminism that, that we believe if we if we've lost or if we haven't won something that that's necessarily means we're wrong i think it just means the enemy is strong it's not to say we shouldn't be look the 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 revisions of feminism and the critical impetus of feminism is vital of course but this this there is a waiting that to me is bizarre like roe falls after decades of right-wing male-led movements to kill it. And what we do is talk about feminism's failures. And one of the huge challenges is that universities are seeing real challenges in humanities and social sciences. So it is gonna be much harder to get universities to put up the critical support that's exactly. needed for these kinds of endeavors. There are still fights going on about names. Um, Kate Stimson was so smart when she launched this journal, The Scholarship on Women, because the F word, feminist word, could not be spoken. And now we're in another political moment where feminism is totally under attack in a more vicious and virulent way than it was at any time during my editorship. Those kinds of battles are intellectual, but they're also existential. But I think things, and I, science is clearly already well aware of this, that speak um, beyond the academy, that speak to a general public who will be interested in the issues that science cares about, um, of finding more ways to do that. But you know, you think about the ways in which social media has just transformed conversations. I don't know how that's going to intersect in the future with scholarly publishing, but I, it seems absolutely critical that any future editorial office be thinking really hard about that. It feels really daunting to me right now for all because of all the changes. Very daunting to think about taking on the next 25 years of science. Science must, must remain a source of reliability. With AI, Living in the age of disinformation, which is the name of our age, I think, there has to be a place that is trustworthy. You might disagree with us, 
but we do try to think through to some kind of realities. And if those realities are going to change, we're going to say how they've changed. But that said, the defense of the work we're doing has to be inseparable from the defense of intellectual institutions. We know the moment we're in, though. So it's so the next few years are just going to have to be defense, defense. But what always? What are our hopes? What are our utopian visions? But what is the future I would like to bring into being? And what are our hopes? Because those early days, despite the grumbling and the fret, as I said, the infighting and the carrying on, and there's much carrying on there was this great sense of possibility. I think that's part of one thing we have to fight against. The future seemed more open. That sense of our utopianism, love, equality, care for children, that's our utopia. And that's what we have to work for. Mesa Hines lived to be 150 because of its commitment to reliability and trustworthiness and sense of imagination that the intellect can bring us.